Okay, so thanks for having me. I mean, I love B2B. Um, I have been, my job is really to run around the planet. I do a lot less running around the planet these days, um, which I'm actually kind of happy about. I'm actually a little happier that travel has really slowed down a little bit, but um, that's one good thing I think that has come out of the, the last three years. But really working with brands, and mostly I would say, it's, it's interesting listening to the, the clients get right off there because a lot of them are B2C, but I spend most of my time in B2B organizations and larger B2B organizations and working on content, content marketing and, and, and content strategy for those businesses to help them make sales, marketing, communications, a little better in the modern world, uh, certainly in the modern digital driven world that we're all in these days. And so that's what we'll talk a little bit about because so our lens that we look through is certainly from the consulting side of things, looking at the businesses like yours. But then I also have a second job, which is as chief strategy advisor for the Content Marketing Institute, where we do research uh, every year into what's going on in B2B, especially when it comes to content marketing and content strategy and all of the challenges that are there. And we see a few things that are going on here. But before I talk about that, I wanna, one of the things that comes up a lot is, and this may be top of mind for you, I get this question a lot from the C-suite in, especially in B2B, which is, okay, content, what does that even mean? Uh, what, 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 what are we talking about here? What do we, what do we really mean by content? Because that sounds like, it sounds like everything, right? And then you just sort of let that hang there and you go, yeah. It really is. It, it really kind of is. And it reminds me so much of the, the in, back in 2005, I think it was, John Foster Wallace, who was a uh, poet, wonderful author. He has, his most famous thing was, this is water. It was a, 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 a graduation speech that he gave to Kenyon College back then. And in that speech he talked and he told this little parable and he said that there, one day, there are two fish swimming along and these two fish are swimming along and having to find morning, and an older fish is swimming in the opposite direction. And as the older fish passes the two younger fish, the older fish says, hey, how's the water? And the two younger fish swim on for a little bit, and finally one of the younger fish looks at the other fish and says, what the hell is water? And the whole point of his story was that it was awareness the, sometimes the most obvious things around us are the things that we have the hardest times getting our heads around in terms of even comprehending what they are. And to me, it was a perfect analogy for content in business. In business, and especially in marketing and communications, content is our water. We swim in it every day. And we can't even really comprehend how to get our arms around it in so many ways because it is just so pervasive. One of the reasons that we see content marketing struggling so much in larger organizations is because where do you even start? Like where do you even begin to start to create something that is in such a huge piece of what it is we do as an organization in communication? Because that's really all it is at the end of the day. When we say content strategy or content marketing strategy, in many ways we could be, it's synonymous with communication. It's how are we communicating with our audiences, with our constituents, with our customers, and developing a deeper sense of trust in what it is that we do, how we want to communicate. It's really all it is. But that's such a pervasive thing that it can be in many ways one of the most difficult things to try and get our arms around. So as I mentioned, we work with uh, a number of businesses, and over the last three, four years, some of the largest companies in the world, you know, all of them, by the way, having some of the same struggles that I'm sure you all are. It is very, very common to see content marketing become this thing that we want to do, but we don't quite have our arms around how we want to do it yet. And I will tell you from personal experience, having worked with so many of the biggest brands in the world, the ones that you really think have all their you know what together do not have all their you know what together. 
They do not. They are struggling at this. It is, you know, as we are starting to see now with some of the biggest companies on the planet, they are being held together by bailing water and or bailing wire and WD-40. I mean, it is it is really coming apart at the seams. But there's a few disruptions that we're seeing that I've put into three basic categories that I think really encapsulate what we're seeing right now. I don't know if we're allowed to even say post-pandemic yet, but post-pandemic, certainly post-2020, 2021, and as we get into 2023 and beyond. And the first of that is this idea of what I, and I just haven't been able to come up with a better term than this, supply-induced physical scarcity. And what I mean by that is that this right here, this, what we're doing today, is just a lot more precious than it used to be. It's just harder to do it. It's just hard. We value our physical presence at places in a lot higher uh, degree than we used to pre-2020. And so what does that mean? What are the implications of that, that value that we're now placing on this physical presence and what we're doing? Well, there's a couple of implications to that. The first of all is this needs to be a lot higher quality. So our customer events, the things that we're doing when we get in front of a customer, when we get salespeople at a conference, all of those things that we're going to these days, the pressure for those things to be higher and more remarkable is really high. The second and much more prevalent we find in businesses, especially in B2B, is that digital has now, and digital experiences and digital content experiences have now become even more important than they were because they have to be a proxy. They have to be a proxy for the physical experience that we used to actually enjoy so much of. So salespeople, how many of salespeople are now having all of their experiences with their prospective customers in digital form and presenting digital content and presenting digital thought leadership and doing so on Zoom and doing so in any kind of, in any number of digital events and webinars and thought leadership, all of those things are much more prevalent than they were in 2019. We've seen the research to see how much they're growing. We've also seen the research to see how much account-based marketing is now happening in the digital world. It's happening over Zoom. It's happening online through content hubs, through engagement, and how much more of the customer journey is now being propelled through digital content as opposed to meeting them in a cafe and going through a PowerPoint, meeting them at the foot of their big boardroom and going through a big PowerPoint with your client, meeting them at a conference, getting squishy balls, all the things that are happening now are happening in much more of a digital way. And so content becomes more important, more content. Most of the, t the, the companies that I'm visiting with these days in their marketing teams, content marketing, the whole, yeah, let's create some white papers, let's create some blogs, let's create some things that are really interesting. That's nice, but guess what? A whole lot more stuff just got added to your desk. It just, it just, there's so much more now. That brings us to the second disruption that we're seeing, which I'm calling the return of push content. So I'm old enough, and I have the gray hair to show it now, I'm old enough to remember the days of AOL and CompuServe and signing online and listening to that wonderful little tone of the modem trying to connect and do the handshake and all that wonderful stuff. Yeah, I remember it all. And in those days, you would sign on to whatever online service and you, the content you got was the content you got. The, that was it. That's what you got. If you went to Yahoo, you hoped Yahoo, you really hope, really def, desperately hoped Yahoo got updated because it was a manually built index of all the interesting sites on the internet. And what did we do? We surfed the internet. That was sort of becoming an entertainment. An idea of research was to actually just go surf websites which is weird today. It seems weird that you're actually just surfing, hoping that you were gonna come across something interesting. And in those days, content was pushed to you. It was pushed. The interesting thing is, is that Google changed all of that, right? Search changed all of that, where everything became on demand now, whether it was social media and filtering through the content that you hopefully wanted to see or that you wanted to see over time, to search, which has now become the idea of, content that I want when I want it and where I want it, that has now almost become inefficient. Google is now inefficient. There's new research out that shows how Google, we are all dissatisfied with Google search these days. 
30, uh, or excuse me, 30 percent of us, only 30 percent of us, do not change our search, res, uh, search query based on the first set of search results we get. And you know this. You've lived this every day. You go to Google and you search for something. That's, that's not what I wanted. And you change your search. And that's not what I wanted. And so you, try, you add more. You change out the keywords. You're trying to get it exactly what you want. Research now shows that we believe, as consumers, we believe Google is getting dumber. And Google's not getting dumber. The thing is, there's just so much content to serve us. Google is actually trying to get smarter. Because as my friend, the SEO expert, Arnie Keen, used to say, the best place to hide a dead body is the second page of Google search results. <laughs> and so if we don't find it on the first page, we're not looking any further. And so Google has to be much smarter about surfacing that content. They also have a monetary reason to want to do that, surface that content and get it up there. And so we're all fighting for that real estate. Everybody's fighting for that real estate with Google search. And so they're trying to even pull it, surface up that, push the content to us. We've all been TikToked. TikTok doesn't have search, really. I mean, they do have search, but you don't use it. Anybody, or your kids, anybody, some closet TikTok watchers here? I'm sure there's some closet TikTok watchers here. My, my wife is now addicted to TikTok. She's on, I can hear it in the other room. You, the, the, all the same songs you hear, you know, oh no, oh no, oh no, yeah, right? And you're like, okay, she's on TikTok again. So the, all of that is content that is pushed to you. It learns quickly. So all of you who are considering things like account-based marketing or personalization or targeted content based on intent data or all of the things that you're thinking about in using data in order to push content to consumers or prospects or customers faster, easier, without them having to search for it and targeted to their needs, that's push content. And that pressure is getting more and more. And guess what the result of that is? We need more content because we have to account for all of the ideations and iterations of content that need to exist. So yet more content we need. And the last is probably the <laughs> one that we spend probably the most time on these days, I will tell you, in content marketing, which is the decline of trust and truth. Boy, we're in the thick of it now. <laughs> we are in the thick of it now. I mean, just coming out of the last week, but research is showing Edelman, the big PR firm, of course, does their trust barometer every year. And this year, 2022, trust was as low as it's ever been. Trust in our mainstream institutions like mainstream media, trust in government, trust in nonprofits, trust in each other, all at an all-time low. And we feel this. You feel this in the culture. We feel this everywhere. And we can certainly have you know, a big bottle of wine or tequila, as the case may take, to actually talk about that. But the more important thing is, is that what they also found was the idea that business is the only trusted institution left. It is the only business, it is the only industry, I should say, that is considered both ethical and competent. And so that provides an interesting opportunity for us as marketers and communicators and business leaders. So let's talk about those things, because those are challenges that we're seeing. But what we're seeing even more importantly is as we think about what Foster Wallace said with the idea of water and, and content and where it's everywhere and so pervasive, is that, yes, that's how we're reacting. More content, please. When we do our research every year at Content Marketing Institute, and this is the hot off the presses, as I should say, two weeks ago, we released our 2023 research, content marketing. This is big. I am not surprised that it is a hot topic for all of you for this event. More content. The top 23 investments. These are all B2B companies, by the way. These are the top three, or excuse me, top five 2023 investments. Video, owned media, events, paid media, and community. All of them content. Every single one of them content, 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 content. That is a huge trend. And by the way, last year it was even higher before. So it just continues to rise. It just continues to rise in importance and what we're trying to drive for more content. However, maybe my first, I guess, provocative statement is that what I'll tell you is, is that your content will not differentiate you. It never will. The content you create will never differentiate you in a sustained competitive advantage. It just won't. Content does not differentiate you in a sustained competitive advantage. Why not? Because if you're fantastically, wonderfully successful and you create something viral, guess what? Your competitors are, com are competing with you for that first page of Google search results the next day, copying everything you just did. I read your white papers. I, I, I geek out on white papers and thought leadership. None of you are saying anything that different. 
I geek out on blog posts, on B2B blog posts that I don't understand about mechanical engineering, about power supplies, about engine, you know, all of those things. I look at those things and, and you could replace the logos on any one of those things. However, that content is amazing and wonderful and it is super valuable. It is amazingly valuable, but it's not going to differentiate you. That is not what is going to differentiate you in the long term. How can we actually differentiate, get sustained competitive advantage? Here's a perfect example of this. Salesforce, who gets content, by the way, probably better than most B2B companies on the planet, just this year launched a streaming service to compete with Netflix and CNN Plus, which is a really low bar, but let's, we can get beyond that. But CNN Plus or Netflix or Amazon Prime, they're out there competing with that with an entire streaming network. But they're not gonna differentiate on the content. They don't differentiate on their content. The content you get on Salesforce Plus is quite commoditized, actually. It's podcasts, video podcasts that you can subscribe to separately. It's content from Dreamforce, which you've seen you know, before with other thought leaders giving the same speech, with some celebrities giving the same exact keynote that they give at every single other conference. It shows where you've seen the content. Now, the collection of content itself might be really interesting, but the whole point is that Salesforce Plus the content is not what differentiates them. What differentiates Salesforce Plus is the fact that they treat content like a media company does. When we talk about content marketing and content strategy, it is not about marketing ourselves like a media company. It is about operating like a media company. In other words, they treat content like a product. They treat the creation, management, activation, measurement, and resources that they provide to content marketing and content strategy and thought leadership like a media company would. It is an operation for them where they have alignment, where they have standards, where they have guidelines, where they have studios, where they have creation, management, strategy, keywords, taxonomies, all of those things being treated in an important way as an operation, an aligned operation. For them, content and the content team is not just the on-demand vending machine of thought leadership articles and blog posts. It is a functional operation in their business, and that's what even makes a Salesforce Plus even possible, is the fact that they treat it that way. So that's the real key here. The content you create will not create a, susta a sustained competitive advantage, but an operation of content marketing and content strategy in your business just might. Every time you see a successful, wonderful content marketing approach, what I'll point you to you know, a case study that you might see at an event or, you know, you'll see it winning awards or something like that. Every single one you'll point to, I will point you to an operation of content that is actually strategic in their business. They look at it in that way. It is not just something that they do as a side business of digital marketing or as a side business of SEO or as a side hustle with sales enablement. It is absolutely a strategic function. And that's what we need to talk about because more content is not enough. More content is not enough. You will not scale to meet the more demand. And so how do we do that? Well, let's first start with this myth, what I've been calling the myth of the empowered buyer. And this is in B2B probably the biggest thing that we talk about when it comes to creating different operations of content. Because we've grown up somehow over the last 10 years as content has become more important in B2B, we've grown up with this belief somewhere, someone somewhere said, probably some big consulting firm somewhere said, there's an asymmetric relationship now between the buyer and the seller in B2B. They have more information than we do. And we went, oh, okay, all right, well, that's a real bummer for us, but okay, I buy that. And we, nobody ever went, really? Is that really true? Is, that, is, it, is it really true? Because here's the thing, yes, all the things that we see happening in all, you know, Forrester and Gartner and everybody putting out their research, these are all true, right? 71% of buyers begin their process with a generic Google search. I absolutely believe that. I think that's absolutely true. Certainly how we operate when we're gonna buy something. When we look at 68% buyers prefer to search independently. I don't doubt that either. I don't, I don't doubt that they prefer to search independently. I also don't, buy or don't uh, dispute the fact that 90% of our customers won't take a cold call. I won't take a cold call. I'm not even going to take, we, we're not going to take cold calls from our mom, much less, much less a salesperson. 
It's amazing to me. You know, when you get a phone call these days, if they didn't text you before to tell you that they were calling, you're going, why are they calling me? I, why, would they, why would they not tell me that they're going to call me? No, click, click, your app, you know, and you, you do the double click, right? The double click to like, you know, to forcefully, like you want to hang up a phone, click, click. No, I am not talking to them. It's like, well, no, I want to just single click them, let it ring for a while. That's the, because you know that trick, yes? Single click for... Let it ring, double click, sends them right to voicemail. Anyway, that's your hack for the day. Anyway, 90% of us won't take a cold call. I absolutely believe it. I absolutely believe it. I believe all those things. Why? Why is that true? Because here's the thing. When we look at it, 77% of B2B buyers these days, this is not our research. This is research that comes from uh, Gartner, state that their latest purchase was very complex or extremely hard. We have to remember, it's not just the marketing process and the sales process that became more complex when digital reared its head. The buying process became way more complex. Really hard. Brent Adamson at Gartner does some amazing work in this space. He really focuses here. And what he found in his research is, in many ways, the single biggest obstacle purchasing today is a buying problem that has nothing to do with us as a seller. That's the key in the research we do when we talk about the buying process with our clients, when we talk to them about how they actually make purchases. Yeah, they're definitely forming a committee and they're doing the team thing and it's four people or six people. And the reason it's four or six people to make a meaningful purchase in a, in a B2B buying cycle these days is not because they wanna put four to six people on it, it's because they feel like they need four to six people to go out and do all the research. You've now become sort of a, you have to go get your PhD in whatever it is you're gonna go buy. I can't tell you how many of you tell me when you're going to about to buy some big enterprise piece of MarTech, like marketing technology. I literally last week had a call with a CMO, B2B CMO, who said, I have zero, zero, let me repeat that, zero interest in becoming an expert in customer experience technology like Adobe sells with AEM. I, I have zero interest in that, but I have to go become an, uh, an expert in this because if I don't, we're gonna make the wrong choice. We're gonna make the wrong choice of, of buying a particular piece of technology or not. So that's the interesting thing to me, is that the buying, comp the buying process has become more complex. So what is the answer to that? The answer is we need to start building ecosystems of content that actually help these people, not just convince them why change. When I look at most organizations and their content, B2B organizations and their content, it's all about why change. At every step of the customer journey, the beginning, why you should change. This new amazing, new paradigm shifting, you know, you always, there's always paradigm shifting stuff. It's always shifting the synergies of the paradigm and it's always gonna shift that paradigm. And if you're gonna shift it into this new approach that we're gonna take to change the way that you do business for this particular solution. Change, change, we're gonna change. And your whole point is to get them to want to change, get them to want to change. They, get, they become a lead, and then the salespeople get in on it. And the salespeople are literally just distributors of content these days. Because why? Because if they, they're not taking cold calls, but if they get a call, it's gonna be like, oh, you gotta read this new white paper, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And, and, and guess what? The customer's going, yeah, okay, fine, check the box. Add it to my stack of other thought leadership that I'm getting about why to change, why to change, why I should change. And it's just the same all the way through, even after they become customers. It's, it is not uncommon for me to meet B2B customers who are still getting email newsletters from the marketing team from that term saying, hey, here's why you should change. Here's why you should change. Yes, I know. I bought your product. And I'm still getting messages about why I should change into this new paradigm shifting solution. And so can we start to create an ecosystem of content that actually helps people to change? to actually change, to actually help them build, implement, and understand what it's like to actually do these things. And we call this building audiences and building fans, not just followers. So when we do this, what we end up doing, and I would recommend you all do it, is look at your audiences, and that when I'm, by audiences I mean your email database, those whom you are looking at social media, those who are in your CRM system, and the salespeople are, are following up with those. They're all in discrete databases, by the way. You all have different databases for all this stuff, and you're 
trying to think, just how are we going to connect all this stuff? Ah, we're going to connect all this stuff with the blog and the email newsletter and the CRM system. The salespeople are like, get out of my CRM system. I don't want you to touch my CRM. And you're like, OK, hold on. We're thinking about all this stuff. When we do an audience audit of all these things, we put them into four quadrants. And I want you to think about this four, these four quadrants. Because one in the upper right is what we're looking for, the, what we call the zone of action. And what does that mean? It means that they're frequently taking action on anything that we send to them, anything that we do with them, and they're advocates of ours. In other words, they're buying into what we're selling from a thought leadership perspective, and they're frequently taking action. They're sharing it. They're making a phone call on it. They're returning the email that we send to them. They're, whatever it is, they're taking an action on it. That's a fan. We're building fans. And then in the lower left-hand corner, we've got really those who are apathetic, don't take an action at all, never sort of really do anything with that. And by the way, they also disagree with us for the most part. We call those the unintended. That's the you know, analysts that you're sending stuff to. That's the job seekers. It's the competitors who have signed up for your email newsletter. It's all sorts of things. You can delete those. We can delete them. That's the zone of surrender, we call it. Now, the lower right-hand side is the danger zone. That's where we, most of us really don't want to be, which is the people who generally agree with us, but when we send them stuff, don't do anything. How routine is it that we have a 25,000 member email database that we send, we dutifully work hard to send them an email every single Friday, and it's got three bullet points. Every Friday, it's got, three, it's got to have three bullet points because it doesn't look right for the creative director. If it doesn't have three bullet points, it's just unbalanced. So you're running around saying, who's got something that I can put in the newsletter for the third bullet point? I've got to get that third bullet point in there. So you get that third bullet point. Yes, it can go out. It's Friday. It's great. We send it, and crickets, nothing. Maybe 1%, 2%, somewhere these best practices of 1%, 2%, 5% click-through rate became sort of industry standard. Really? That means 95% of people are just like, don't care. Don't care. Open rates in the 30% range. Even when, by the way, we have all preview, we all have email clients with preview windows now. If we're not getting 100% open rates right now, that means before it even previews, they're deleting it. And so thinking about that, where are we? Because the zone of opposition is okay too. If they disagree with us, but they're always taking action, like we're, we're, our point of view or our approach to thought leadership is so controversial that it's actually causing people to argue online and do all this. Yes, that's, that's okay. We want to move them over, obviously, to the more uh, advocate to our work, but that's okay. When we do audience audience for most businesses, this is what we find is that the social channels are kind of meh in the middle, right? It's great. It's okay. It's good. We're getting some, you know, we're getting some engagement there. Social media managers are usually pretty good at their job. They're doing pretty good. Events, you know, these days, yeah, we got a bunch of leads. You know, the event organizer gave us a bunch of leads because we sponsored the event and gave out squishy balls at a booth. But most of them are either analysts or other vendors or students or job seekers or our competition or whoever it is is really not that great. And then when we look at the sales, the sales database, when we look at sales and we go, and, and salespeople are like, yay, 30% is our pipeline. Really? 30%? If, when did that become good that we can close 30%? They're not doing anything. We continually pester them and 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 no change. No change. All the B2B sales consultants, well, no change is the most popular response in a particular B2B sales effort. No, no, no decision made at all. Why not? Because they're down there. Email, same thing in that lower right. The only thing we see sort of in that upper right-hand side where people take action is our community. It's our customer communities. And those are getting to be really popular. The how-to, the learning, the online, the customer events, those sorts of things. So do a customer and an audience audit and see where your audiences are. Because one of the things that I often say is, what if we just stopped? Like, what if we stopped tomorrow sending email? Like, full stop. No more email. No more Friday afternoon emails to our, like, no, none. Zero. No more social posts. No more white papers. No, no more content at all goes out the door. Who would miss it? Like, who would call us up and go, hey, I really miss that Friday afternoon email with the three bullet points. I, I, where is that? I, I miss it. If the only answer is us, we got work to do. And that 
gets us to building this ecosystem. Think like a media company. Start thinking like an ecosystem of content. This is one of my favorite charts of the last few years. The, what you see there in the blue line are the number of streaming networks that are moving from basically dropping all their episodes in one fell swoop, like House of Cards did in 2013, to dropping week by week, which is really, my, like my wife just hates this. Like she cannot stand that they do this now. But why do they do it? It's really smart, of course. The reason they're doing it is they're keeping us engaged. They don't want us going to binge watch House of Cards or Game of Thrones or House of Dragons and then turning off that streaming service until something else interesting comes along. They want us chugging along month by month, paying that monthly fee. That's the number. The, num the orange line that you see are the numbers that are actually creating uh, weekly drops of individual episodes. So keeping subscribers subscribed for longer into an ecosystem of what it is they're trying to do. By the way, the lighter blue in each of those colors are the demand for those things. In other words, what they're successfully doing is convincing us that this is a good thing. That's what the streaming networks are doing. They're also creating the demand, less demand over time for more drops of the entire series and more demand for series that actually stretch out over multiple seasons. That's incredibly powerful for us as B2B marketers. How do we start thinking about our resource centers, our thought leadership centers, less as places where people go binge during the buying season and places rather that they wanna live? Where do they wanna come and hang out? Where do they wanna come and learn about their job? Where do they wanna come and learn about what it is they do in their career? How do we help them become better at their jobs more than just helping them understand why to change? And that can start to help us build that ecosystem. One of the things that helps in thinking through this, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but although we can spend tons of time on it for the, in, during the rest of the day, this is the framework that we use when we say, press the stressor buttons to find out where our weaknesses are in terms of our content operation, that we can actually build that ecosystem. We call it three uh, pillars which is one, coordinated communications. How are we basically doing this across all the different silos that we have to, to manage? Two, operations. How are we creating standards, guidelines, and technology, which is where this will all end up at some point? Where are we creating the, what we call the frame or the infrastructure for all of this, the operations of content? And three are the experiences, the actual managing the experiences that we're creating as a connected set of a portfolio, if you will, of owned media products our website, our resource center, our webinar program, all those different kinds of things. And then we lay over that sort of the pressure points, which are the things that we want to press on and say, where are we strong on this? Are we strong on our purpose? Do we really understand it? Are we strong on our model? Do we really understand our operating model? Do we really understand the technology and how it actually works to connect all these experiences together? Do we really understand the value, the measurement, the insight that we're going to drive? And ultimately, do we understand our audience? Because ultimately, our audience is our customer. And so this model can work, and we can talk more about it for sure. I'll just give you one example of this. This is ServiceNow. The reason I pick ServiceNow is, one, they're B2B. You guys, you guys might use them if you use the project management Jira or anything like that, yeah. So they do workflow. Workflow is the most, it's, it's more boring than any of your businesses, so don't tell me your business is more boring than theirs. Workflow is as boring as it gets. I deal in workflow every day. I find workflow sexy, but a lot of people don't. They do it, that's what they do. They created what they call their workflow quarterly. And the reason I love this so much is because the workflow quarterly is simply a quarterly updated blog. So it doesn't have to be every day. It doesn't have to be Gary Vaynerchuk, go find your stuff on TikTok or anything like that. It's all about a quarterly magazine directed to C-suite. And so they bring in wonderful thought leaders to write thought-provoking articles on workflow and how workflow is demonstrably helping the business. And they're building an audience. They're building a wonderful audience. They won a content marketing award uh, last year for this. 66% growth in subscribers. Yay, that's nice. It's nice for a, an agency like Tricome. And it's like, you know, yeah, we're great. We're, we're fantastic. You know, we're, we're doing well building subscribers. Who cares? What are they doing? Well, they're actually built in a measurement to look at that. Engage traffic. In other words, people who don't sign up for this thing, just engage traffic, five times more likely to fill out a lead form and actually ask for more information which is wonderful. It's a lead multiplier for them. It acts as a virtual salesperson. More importantly, which I love here, is subscribers are 73% more likely to fill out a lead form at some point. 
So they're building an ecosystem of where you want to learn over time and building that over time and understanding that not everybody's looking for workflow software at a particular moment. And so they're building this in to build them to be top of mind when they are actually looking for workflow. So the lessons learned. Quickly, three lessons from this particular challenge. One, content marketing is an integrated sport, a team sport. As I often say, the content marketing team's job is not to be good at content, it is to make the business good at content. And so how are we creating the education, the standards, the guidelines to help salespeople be content creators and distributors and purveyors? How are we helping the C-suite become better at content? How are we becoming better at content, making the business better at content as an operation? Two, the lessons learned, consider, just consider differentiating on an ecosystem across the entire journey rather than trying to only focus in on that buying window uh, when we want to focus in there. And third, building content that's acted upon, building content that always has a call to action, always has a next best step. No dead ends in our content. I read a piece of thought leadership, there is a next best action for me to take. The only way you know what next best action for that to take is if you're working ahead of time, if you're working to where I know that at the end of this white paper I wanna put a link to this webinar which is related to it, et cetera, et cetera. And the only way I get all those things connected in that way is if I have a good operation to be able to do that. And that brings us to the second piece which is the second challenge. This is investing in audiences, not just buyers. So this thing here, when we looked at this framework, you'll remember one of the things that we talked about is finding that right kind of approach. And audiences are key here. Connecting those audiences are key because if we understand that, we will ultimately be much better off across the entirety of what it is we're trying to do. And so what we do is we look at a process. So what do you put into each of those circles? Well, we put a process in, an operational process. And again, it'll, this will be something I go through quickly because we can, we can spend all day on this, but I'll go through this quickly because it points out where most B2B businesses are challenged right now. When we look at it, we say first, planning and prioritization of content. A team that handles this, someone who owns this in your pure racy sort of model, who handles the planning and prioritization of content. Most content teams that we see are on-demand vending machines. They are the internal kinkos of the content group. Sales asks for content, the C-suite asks for content, marketing asks for content, demand gen asks for content, and they basically are like short order cooks and they're just basically making content up as they go. Planning and prioritization is a critical function and it's the one, quite honestly, that we see the least in the organizations that we work with. Second, separating out the idea of content creation and digital asset production. Whenever I hear a CFO or a CMO come to us and say, we create way too much content already, I go, really? Let's look at that. Because what we mostly find is, nope, you're actually not creating that much or too much content, you're actually producing way too many digital assets. In other words, what we conflate is this idea of content with the container that it sits in. And we think about this, right? When someone says we need content, they don't say we need a story or we need a narrative or we need thought leadership. They say I need a PDF or I need a case study or I need a blog post or I need a white paper or I need a web page or I need an email. And we go, great, now our container is defined and we need to actually reverse that whole thing. To say we need a story, we need content, we need thought leadership. Let's use that to actually understand which and what digital assets need to be created from that. With that. <laughs> yeah. So that's a really key component. Separating those out as two parts of the same process. Then merchandising, because once you separate those things out, now we're creating content that will live in multiple places across that buyer's journey for multi perhaps even multiple audiences, but certainly in multiple channels. So we need to merchandise it because Quite honestly, we may be wanting to tier the distribution of it, or we may be wanting to schedule it a little differently. So merchandising that content internally, and then of course, activation and promotion of content as well. And then finally, not certainly lastly, but though usually at the last is of course measurement and insight and comes right back around to the planning and prioritization. So this process, think about how we might put that into the content team. Big stories at the center, we call this our story package process. Big stories with lots and lots and lots of ways to tell that story. 
molecular content, if you like. Some people call it big rock content, if you like. Whatever you like, basically. How do we create few big stories and turn them into lots and lots of little stories? I talk to lots of B2B companies, especially highly technical ones, where just getting one white paper out of a subject matter expert can take months. Let's, let, let's, I mean, we can have a drink over why they shouldn't take months to do that. Like, their thinking isn't that deep, but okay. They, but, you know, it's, it, and, but by the time it hits your desk, it's a PhD thesis with lots of four, you know, syllable words, and you're like, okay, how am I going to turn this into something actually readable? And so, how do we take that idea and actually ask for more from that subject matter expert to turn it into lots and lots of little things rather than try and wrestle with one big thing? The key here is that understanding our buyer is not just a buyer, they are a person. And understanding that the buying journey that they're going through now, as complex as it is, isn't the only thing they do in their lives and isn't their only job and in fact may be the least favorite part of what they're doing in their job is actually looking for a new solution that your solution is going to be a match for. So when we look at sort of the funnel, the customer engagement funnel, buyer persona, by the way, is only a very small part of that. One of the things I always often ask about buyer personas is like if we've developed buyer personas, and it's like, oh, great, now where's your customer? What are your customer personas? Like, well, that's the same. No, it's not. Didn't they change after they bought your product and get such amazing value out? Didn't they? Didn't their needs and wants change after they bought your product? And didn't? Shouldn't they be different? Shouldn't we be dressing different values? Yeah. Well, yeah. But more importantly, for our discussion here, audience personas. Who are they before they knew what you they needed? Who are they before they actually understand that your solution is going to be one that they need? Let's understand them as people, so that we can start to think about how we might solve challenges that they have before they actually understand that they're in need of a particular solution. Here's a great example of this. SAP, again, another big, boring software company. They're a client, they, we've worked with them for a number of years. And what I love so much about this case study is, is that how they actually changed and pivoted and got less wrapped around the axle of what they were trying to do. So they had a blog, and they still have it, it's their I think they, it's, it's got a very, very catchy title, like the customer experience and e-commerce experience blog, right? I mean, it's, it's so SAP, it couldn't even be more SAP, but that's their name of their blog. It's basically their customer experience blog, where they talk about software and CX and UI and how, you know, Hybris is this and all sorts of wonderful things about what SAP software does. And it's thought leadership and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's doing fine. It's doing wonderful, actually, from a performance standpoint. But of course, during COVID, nobody wanted to talk about CX software or e-commerce software or anything like that. So what they did was they didn't just go, you know what, that's our brand message, that's our messaging, that's our sales messaging, that's what we're going to do, we're just going to continue to talk about that. They completely pivoted the editorial based on what the customers wanted, what they needed. And because they understood their audiences, what they knew that the audience wanted at that particular moment was help with COVID resources. And so they partnered up with Johns Hopkins University and then they switched the editorial completely. And so they started talking about how you're going to deal with reopening and how you're going to deal with COVID and how you're going to deal with this and how you're going to deal with that, how you're going to deal with employees, how you're going to deal with customer experience from a new digital experience, you know, all of those things reg regarding COVID. And what happened when they did that? Well, they're 200% growth in traffic. Yay, wonderful. Again, nice case study for the agency, but who cares? More traffic is what? Okay, but the interesting thing is 91% to 71% to SEO. So they actually went down in search. So that's usually a big red flag, like, oh my gosh, we're going down in search. We've, we're, but of course they are, because they're not even focusing on their keywords or key phrases anymore. They're going down in search traffic. The interesting thing is, is that that 200% growth in traffic represented a 30% increase for return traffic. So people were becoming more loyal to that, more interested in what they were doing, coming back, taking action on every blog post that they were actually putting out there. Now, here's the, here's the punchline of the whole thing, they've pivoted back slowly over the last 18 months and they've kept that audience and they're getting more leads as a result of it. They're creating trust by building an ecosystem of content that addresses more than just driving some sales. They're actually adding value to their audience's uh, lives. So the lessons learned here, content operations, big. It is the differentiating factor built around the idea that content creation, content creation and production are separate ideas. 
pulling that in. Second, understand how you can start delivering value outside of what it is, your product, your service, your brand. Hashtag all the audiences. And then slow down that creation process. One of the big pushbacks that I often get from talking about content operations and workflow and how we're gonna actually put this in. The big, biggest pushback I get is, well, it sounds like you're gonna really slow things down. Yep, I wait for it. I'm gonna slow down that content creation process. I want us to be much more thoughtful about stuff that gets put into production or put into content creation, much more thoughtful. And then I'm going to exponentially show you how the speed is increased for reuse, repackaging, and management and findability of content on the backside. That's going to more than make up for the slowness that we put in the creation. And the last that we'll cover here is what we call emotional data. This idea of building trust and truth in a new world. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the idea that Edelman came out with, which was their trust barometer, and it's fascinating to me, the two things here. Um, and again, this is probably my favorite thing to talk about when we talk about content marketing. The thing, we talked about the trust being really, really low, and that fact the business scored the highest um, over government, et cetera, you know, sort of in their matrix there, the idea that business is really the only one that's now considered competent and ethical. In other words, the only institution that's still trusted, um, even if it's just barely. That's a fascinating thing to me. Here was the more fascinating thing to me. And I know there's gonna be some talk about sustainability later today and account-based marketing and all sorts of things. This feeds right into all of that which is the headline, and my favorite, by the way, the Edelman Trust Barometer may be one of my favorite pieces of content marketing that has existed. I mean, they've done this for now a decade. It's just a remarkable piece of work that Edelman has done there. It's just, it's just, it's just a fascinating thing. Their, their headline there, societal leadership is now a core function of business. I love that, that I mean, I love that headline. That's the headline. Societal leadership is now a core function of business. Now, why did they say that? Because what they talked about was the level of trust. Now, I'm going to get these numbers slightly wrong here because I, I, I can never keep them straight in my head. But basically, 65% of us will now make a decision about being employed by a company based on the story that they're telling and the trust that they're building with their content. 85% of us will make an investment in a company based on the story that they're telling and the societal leadership that they're taking. And 45% of us will make a purchase decision from a company based on the societal leadership and the content and the story that they're telling. So I used to say content marketing is this wonderful lead generation, brand building, wonderful direct marketing replacement idea for what it is you're doing. And it's a wonderful opportunity. And now I say, nope, content marketing is a responsibility. Any company not doing any form of content marketing these days is abdicating a responsibility. And so it has become that important in business to be able to differentiate yourself through the leadership that you're taking in creating the content and stories that you're taking that address the issues, the thought leadership. It doesn't mean we have to all talk about sustainability and climate change and all those things in the same equity and diversity and all those things in the same way. What it means is that we have to take positions. As businesses, as marketers, as leaders in communication, we have to now take positions on the things that matter to us as a business. And we have to tell that story effectively to create that trust in our consumers. And so, what does that mean? It means leaning in to first party data. It means leaning in to our audiences, leaning in to delivering them targeted, wonderful content that can actually solve problems and drive change. Leaning into this. What has happened? GDPR, CCPA, LGPT, whatever you other, there a whole alphabet soup of, of, of regulations and government laws that are going into effect all over the globe. And most of you are global in nature, so you're dealing with all of it. And what we've done is we've gone to the lowest common denominator of all of them and basically so, tried to solve them all at once. And it's, boy, that's hard. It's really hard. And we're shying away from this idea of first party data collection. And when the exact opposite is true, we have to lean into it, lean into first party data collection. Now we have to do it in a way that we want to drive value for the customer rather than a transaction of sale. And if we do that, we will be living up to the, all the spirit of the GDPR regulations, et cetera, et cetera. Customers, consumers, business or consumers are wary of this. 
they, are, they have a huge side eye right now that they're giving us and our websites about the way that we're using the data that they're collecting. You know, all of you have Mickey Mouse at Gmail in your database, I guarantee you. You all have, if you've got me in your database, you've got please give me the white paper at gmail.com, right? So those are the names that I use because why? We're based on transactions now. We're basing B2B marketing tra on transactions of content rather than building trust with audiences. So how do we lean into first party data and start giving value to that? When, by the way, the first thing we're greeted by on your website is a pop-up saying, by the way, we're gonna track your data and, and, and be mean to you. You're gonna get calls from salespeople. Somewhere along the line, we gave this over. We said, Ugh, I don't feel like dealing with this. Let legal deal with it. Legal has failed miserably on this score by putting up generic pop-ups on, you know, we're tracking cookies. Here's our legal disclaimer, blah, 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 blah. The words we as marketers don't even understand. We're just looking at it going, wow, that is a bunch of gobbledygook right there. And we expect our customers to go, yup, except, great. All we're doing is telling customers, you should not trust us. That's what we're doing with our, with our, with our uh, wonderful uh, pop-ups there. So this is not a legal challenge. This is not a technology challenge. This is a customer experience. This is a marketing. This is a content challenge. We have to step up and take responsibility for leaning into this. Why not do a customer pop-up that instead of says, hey, we're going to put cookies on your site and legal, 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 legal. Why don't we say, hey, listen, I mean, this, this would literally just be a change of content. Put the pop-up to say, hey, listen, we want to deliver you targeted, wonderful value here and give you thought leadership and a great experience. In order to do that, we have to do some stuff. Would you just mind saying yes to this? Just change the content to something more user-centric. Yes, fine, do it. I mean, we're all used to clicking it anyway, but why not even just take that baby step? In any event, the, all, the real key here is delivering a content strategy that actually delivers on valuable audiences that we can then use the data to target better experiences, account-based experiences, whatever it is, to them. Now, how are some companies dealing with this? Companies the size of all of yours? They're acquiring other media companies. They're becoming media companies and they're doing it through acquisition. So Salesforce has certainly been doing this. Salesforce is the acquisition uh, of, you know, of uh, a CMO club. They bought the entire CMO club, that whole community. They're doing it. Pendo, the uh, wonderful product management startup, they just bought um, the uh, Mind the Product community, bought, you know, I don't know, a few hundred thousand of product managers. And they're now, that's their content marketing platform. We see this all the time happening with HubSpot, acquiring the hustle, buying them. There are acquisitions happening all over the place. Aero Electronics, maybe my favorite case study of this over the last few years, Aero Electronics, right? Huge, large electronics distributor. They made 53 acquisitions over the last five years. 53 acquisitions. They have bought up just about every electronics engineering magazine out there. It's owned now by Aero Electronics and they've created a separate division where they have EE Times, they have all of this. Why? Because as they said, we have to keep electrical engineers interested in doing electronics. Otherwise, our TAM shrinks. And they started noticing all these publications just going away, going away, going away. So they said, hey, we can keep them as money makers. Maybe they don't make a ton of money, but it's a rounding error in our marketing budget to keep them just above the profitability line. And it keeps the electrical engineers happy because they did the research, they know their audience, and what did they discover about their audience was that 70-something percent of engineers make all of their career decisions based on the blogs they read, the magazines, the professional journals that they read, and the communities that they're a part of online. So they said, why wouldn't we subsidize that? Why wouldn't we make that a viable strategy? That's building trust with an audience. I love this because this is a way for us to jumpstart our efforts and immediately jump into first party data collection without having to worry about pop-ups and all of those kinds of things about our marketing. We can start learning what our audience cares about, what they want by understanding them from that publication um, perspective. So great examples of this, right? This is one of my favorites, Sykes Enterprises. They're a consulting firm down in Florida and they deal with financial services companies primarily. And they acquired a, a publication called the Penny Hoarder Magazine. The Penny Hoarder Magazine meaning millions of subscribers, financial literacy for the most part, how to open a credit card and all that kind of stuff. So why would they do that? Well, Chuck Sykes, the president and CEO, said it very well. He said, the insights that we get, the knowledge we get will not only help us enable better strategies, but will help us give our clients better strategies. 
So they're going to their clients and saying, hey, how would you like to know what people really think about interest rates or what people really think about what the most popular things are or what, you know, what their answers to these polls are? Once we start getting beyond the idea that first party data is a lot more than just email address, it's intent, it's our answers, it's our passions, it's our consumption, it's all of the things that we care about, and email address is really low on that list at that point. And personally identifiable information is actually low on that list. We can glean so much insight and so much value by just simply knowing what our audience as an aggregate cares and is passionate about. And we can start delivering content based on that. Now all of a sudden we're doing things much more effectively and we're operating like a media company. And I'll just close with the idea of technology because when we talk about all of this, we can't escape the idea that all of this is a bridge to technology and how we're managing technology these days. And so when we look at it, and we do a study on this every year, content management, content tech, we, we call it, which is how our, our business is doing this. 78% of marketers say right now they take a strategic approach to managing their content through technology, which is really nice. And you go, wow, 80%, 80% of people say that they're taking a, nope, only half of those are actually doing it. <laughs> we say we're doing it, but we're not doing it. We're not, we're not doing it. Anybody love their CMS? No. I love my CMS, said no marketing person ever. It doesn't matter what it is, by the way. We hate our CMSs. We, they just all suck. Okay. The third, the top two reasons why they don't care, a lack of process and a lack of priority from leadership. Because why? And this is the dirty secret of content strategy and content marketing. It's kind of working right now. It's working okay. And so to make it work great means a big change, means big changes. And everybody goes, you know, there's the whole, I, I hate this term so much, but, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? You know, in order to make it really amazing, we're going to have to make some relatively significant changes. And the C-suite goes, really? Because it's kind of working right now. Our, our CMS, is, is it broken? No, it's not broken. Is it working? Yeah, but things are really slow and it's really hard for us to do stuff and it takes us 18 weeks to launch a blog post when it should have taken like two minutes. Okay, but really, is that a big problem? Like, is that gonna drive revenue this year? <sighs> That's the big sigh you get, okay. But here, do we have the right technology? No, we don't feel like we do. But the real key here is, is that we're either not using the technology that we have to its potential or we haven't acquired the right technology. Most of it, I will tell you, is the former. We have not used the technology we have to its fullest potential. Why? We're too busy trying to find more technology. I read a statistic the other day that 30% of our marketing time is now either spent looking for new technology, implementing technology, or learning to use technology we've just implemented. That's 30% of our time is spent trying to figure out how we're going to push buttons to make stuff happen. We just have to be better. We have to be better at connecting the technology that's appropriate. And the way that we do that is to not build our technology acquisition strategy around the coolest new capabilities, but to rather build a process, build an operation that is facilitated by technology. This is thought leadership. I am sure every single one of your businesses is giving to your clients. Don't buy a new engine, don't buy a new power source before you understand how and why you're going to use that new power source and that new engine. How is it going to fit into your overall strategy? But yet we buy MarTech by, oh my God, it does this. It does this amazing, cool new thing. It's got the metaverse built into it. We're gonna buy it. We're gonna make sure that buy it. Build that process into each of those pillars and facilitate each of those processes with the right connected technology to each other. And we can certainly talk about suites versus best in class versus all of the different areas of MarTech. The ones that we're seeing most often in each of these process these days, content calendaring and collaboration, usually one of the biggest pieces missing in that prioritization piece. Huge opportunity, I think, to connect those things. Digital asset management, getting beyond the you know, file and folder, stuff, getting beyond SharePoint. Let's just all get beyond SharePoint. Can we just all get beyond SharePoint at this point? I mean, SharePoint is just a useless tool. Sorry if there's any Microsoft fans in the room. Content creation suites, digital experience management, CDPs, analytics. Those are the key pieces of technology that we're seeing in these processes. And so we can talk about what each of those mean and when we get into discussion and if that's valuable for any of you and what we're seeing out there. But the key is, is that they're connected together, connecting those experiences together. The content you create will create no sustainable competitive advantage, but an operation will. Looking at it and operating like a media company, that's 
what will create it. And it's not about efficiency. As I said, it's kind of working right now. So our focus tends to be on how do we make content more efficient in our business? How do we do things more efficiently, more efficiently, more efficiently? How do we do it? If we go all the way back to our friend Michael Porter, who told us things not to do, and when that's how important that is, I love this quote because he says it's, efficiency is seductive because it's actionable. It shows measurable results. But ultimately, those results go to zero. You can only get so efficient before you start really dampening what it is you're doing. But beyond efficiency, what different activities? How are we approaching things differently than our competition? How are we operating differently than our competition? That's what will make a meaningful difference here. Are you treating your content as products? This will tee us up for our break and our discussion. Are you creating content that you treat as importantly as your products? If not, I would suggest that it's humbly that it's as important. Content, the content you're creating, the white papers you're creating, the resource centers you're creating, it's as important in many ways, if not more important these days, than the products and services that you offer into the market. Two, do you have a measurability paradox? Because you're not planning and prioritizing, because you're looking at content as sort of every, everybody's job and nobody's strategy, it's really, we can measure performance. We got all kinds of tools to measure performance. How many downloads, how many page views, how many engagements, how many form fills, all of those are easy. The denominator is easy to measure. The numerator, not so much. How much did that cost us? How much did that white paper cost us? My favorite question to ask a CFO is, how much money are you spending on content every year? And they sort of look at me like my dog looks at me when I whistle funny, it's like, what? It's like, yeah, how much content, how much do you spend on content? That should be an answer we can answer. That's, we should be able to answer that question. How much money are we spending on content every single year? We can only do that if we actually put in planning and prioritization and operation behind it. And third, as I asked before, what if we stopped? Like, what if we stopped? What if we stopped tomorrow everything? Who would miss it? Who would miss our Facebook posts, our LinkedIn posts from a cat hanging from a tree saying, hang in there, baby? Right? Who would miss all that? Like, who would call us up? And if the only answer to that is us or our boss, then we've got work to do and we've got work to do, and it's fun work, and it's interesting work, 